Welcome to the pre-recording of the encryption workshop and panel session. So the 2nd of May in the year 2000 is a very important date in the development of operational security understanding, because it was on that day, on the 2nd of May in the year 2000, that the then US President Bill Clinton invented Pokemon Go. Or rather, Bill Clinton signed some paperwork which disabled some ostensible global safety technology, thereby unknowingly laying the foundations for Pokemon Go and much more to be invented. You see, from its inception in 1978 until May 2000, all civilian use of GPS was hampered by a precautionary principle design restriction called selective availability, where without access to a special kind of GPS receiver, one equipped with a classified, secret, regularly changed encryption key, lacking access to such a receiver meant that the location reported by your GPS system would be inaccurate. How inaccurate? Very inaccurate. Varying randomly by as much as 100 meters. You could be sitting in this building, but your GPS might tell you that you are standing on London Wall or wandering along uh, Moorgate towards Bank Station. The intention of this was safety. In 1978, it was decided that the general public could not be allowed to have generally um, accurate positioning information in case armies of anti-democratic nation states, or in case terrorists amongst us, would use off-the-shelf GPS systems to build self-navigating cruise missiles that would crash into important buildings and assassinate political leaders and things like that. With this insight, it's kind of ironic to reflect on this year's efforts of Ukrainian drone operators who are using off-the-shelf quadcopters to guide artillery and drop grenades onto Russian tanks. It's an impressive display of asymmetric warfare. Not to mention the growing use of GPS itself for geofencing in order to keep quadcopters and other drones away from airport flight paths. But however well-intentioned, it turned out that selective availability had inherent and massive negative economic and military consequences. The military secret GPS receivers were rare and required special handling and the encryption key material even more so, and they were more expensive to produce and it was challenging to put large numbers of them into the field. This was so much of a problem that selective availability fundamentally compromised several purposes of GPS. During the first Gulf War, troops begged their families to send them commercial off-the-shelf GPS receivers because military Navstar units were largely unavailable. Some reports were saying that only two units per 100 vehicles were available. And yet GPS was meant as a key preventative for stopping friendly fire casualties. So the troops decided that any location data is better than no location data at all, even though the civilian units were inaccurate. Also, the overhead of standards and compliance meant that military receivers did not track advancements in user interfaces and display technologies, nor improvements in accuracy which featured in the commercial GPS units. Enhancements that were motivated, not least from efforts to circumvent selective availability, for instance by averaging locations over time, but also by integrating alternative navigation beacons and things like that. So, in function and in practice, selective availability was doomed and it was disposed of with the actual hardware capability being expunged from the GPS specification by the Bush White House in 2007. But what if the world's governments had, forgiven, uh, had forbidden um, civilian circumvention of selective availability? What if it had never been switched off? Then, in that case, here in 2022, there would be no Pokemon Go, there would be no geocaching, there would be no location-based games. There would be no decent in-car navigation, there would be no Uber, there would be no Deliveroo, there would quite possibly be no significant gig economy whatsoever. There would be no Google Street View, there would be no user-generated content on Street View for certain. There would be no sharing of your location, there would be no finding your family in a crowd by using WhatsApp or something like that to share your live location with some accuracy. There would be no child tracking and alerts if you're the sort of person to track your child with the technology. There would no, no, be no um, geofencing for your children. Air tags and similar would be considerably less useful, and similarly for stolen car trackers. There would be, if you find them useful, no speed camera alerts on the motorway. There would be no automated recording of walking routes, which sounds very pedestrian and boring until you realize that means there would probably be no open street map. 
uh, nor indeed everything online which OpenStreetMap gets used for. We would still all be paying Ordnance Survey for British mapping. There would be no precision location for hikers and boats and pilots. There would be no precision crop spraying, which means there would still be excessive use of uh, water, pesticides and fertilizers by agriculture with uh, dumping the chemical runoff into streams and the groundwater system. Uh, so we would have more pollution. There would be no location tagging of photos and no searching of photo albums by location. There would be no photo-based open source intelligence and no solution to a bunch of crimes, like, for instance, the open source intelligence proving the cause of the crash of Malaysian Air Flight 17. This is just a partial list of some of the things which selective availability would have compromised. A full list would be enormous. If selective availability was still active, a huge and rich ecosystem of tools, activities and industries would simply not exist. And worse, we would never know that they should exist by now. So, on that happy note, my name is Alec and welcome to this panel on encryption. Except, this is not really a panel on encryption. When I was approached to chair this session, my brief was to provide a workshop-style panel to demonstrate and explain encryption to the public, including deep dives into how the technologies work, and uh, participants will be shown how to secure their digital environment and what to expect when submitting information securely to third parties, what strong encryption means, and so forth. And then we would all have a uh, debate amongst panelists on the merits and risks of encryption. I've done this many times in the past 30 years, and nowadays it's a lot easier to explain. Encryption should look like your vintage SMS and phone and video chat applications, but it should be much nicer and likely should not cost anything to use. And importantly, governments and telecommunication industry lobbyists should be very angry about them. Also, all the other encryption that you use, like the small end-to-end -end encrypted cloud you probably have of all of your devices, your phone and tablets and smartwatches and fitness trackers, all sharing bookmarks and payment and other data amongst themselves, you should probably not even realize that it is there. Although you should keep an eye out for journalists telling you something is broken or missing, and then you need to fact check the journalists and get angry only if they are correct, only if it's true. Also, most people don't really need to know how encryption works. There is no pressing obligation for a normal human being to be able to explain super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman key exchange and why it is suddenly a bad idea. The question of how to secure your digital environment immediately raises the next question of from whom? Without answer to which we cannot meaningfully respond. There will be different answers. For you, uh, what do you need to protect? For a teenager pursuing an abortion in some parts of the USA, something different. Versus uh, an Iranian woman's rights activist who will have different communication requirements and a different security threat model. Versus whoever our foreign secretary is this week and what nation states are attempting to hack into their phone. In summary, the only legitimate answer to how to secure develop your development environment, or how to secure your environment rather, is it depends. It depends on you and it depends on who is trying to attack you and your awareness of that situation. So we've covered explaining and demonstrating encryption, how encryption works, and how to secure your environment. The next and more interesting question is, what do people expect when submitting information securely to third parties? And the answer is actually surprisingly straightforward. People expect what they submit to third parties that it will not be seen, scanned, or processed by fourth parties, assuming that fourth parties are anybody else in this picture. The technical word for this is trust. And it is exhibited when, in the way that people actually care about what they actually expect, their credit card details not being ripped off and cloned in transit to a supermarket website. Or for that matter, if it was Tesco, then whether it really is the Tesco website or one of their approved partners on whose website they are clicking. These are issues and matters of trust. People expect that iCloud or Google Chrome syncing will not leak their passwords nor their personal information. And similarly for messaging, people expect that their messages will only be read by those people they intend, not by hackers, 
not by platform employees, not by government spies nor covert law enforcement. From people's basic expectations, we can derive the most fundamental political and moral questions of modern information technology. And with those, we define strong encryption as encryption which meets these obligations, and thereby, in meeting those obligations, provides a firm foundation about which one may reason um, about security models in the construction of innovation. Now, when I was approached to chair this session, I was asked if I have an organization which I work for and represent uh, so that we could list it on the website, which is presumably meant as a kindness to attendees so that they can work out who to cheer and who to boo. I don't have anything like that, not for the past two years. I am a full-time stay-at-home dad. I'm a primary carer. I change nappies. I do all of the laundry. I do most of the cleaning prepare food, wipe snotty noses, read books, sing songs, ferry my daughter to and from activities, play peekaboo, and so I suggested to the organizers that maybe they could put me down as a consultant or something like that. Bless them, this was evidently not quite what they were looking for, and so everybody, not just me, but everybody on the agenda, suddenly in gained improved speaker biographies, reflecting some of what they do, some of what they have achieved, rather than merely who they work for. In doing this, they implicitly made an important point that we need to stop talking about abstract labels, that we need instead to talk about impact. So in the same spirit, uh, exhibiting the same spirit of not talking about labels but about impact, I want to rename this session. This is no longer a session about encryption. Instead, this is now a session on giving people everywhere greater privacy, assurance, and confidence, and enabling them to keep secrets even from the state. Because that's what encryption actually does. That is the impact of the technology. This does not dilute the gravity of what we will discuss in this panel. Because the ability to keep a secret is dangerous, and the abilities to speak and share ideas in secret are even more dangerous. These capabilities can assist disruption, political disruption, social uh, disruption. They can assist conspiracy and genuine harm. They can undermine uh, accountability. And they can enable bad people uh, to do bad things. But all of these are assistance because it's also entirely possible, in fact, even quite commonplace, to be a malicious actor or an abuser or a troll whilst using unencrypted clear text communication, with or without anonymity. Even face-to-face -face is possible. In this world, there are a small number of people, very, very genuinely bad people, who would use greater privacy like they would any other public facility in order to do bad things. But to be adults in an open society, we need to understand and discuss the cost-benefit analysis of giving people everywhere greater privacy, assurance, and confidence, and enabling them to keep secrets even from the state. Just as with selective availability in 1978, we fear a novel technical capability, privacy, which may be used to commit atrocious harm, but nobody is currently advocating for the other side of the balance scale. And this is bad, because not only are our fears massively overblown and our proposed remedies somewhat disproportionate, but they also keep us from recognizing that unobvious future innovations will probably stand upon our giving people everywhere greater privacy, assurance, and confidence, and enabling them to keep secrets, even from the state. Um, to reframe a popular cliché, we must consider the balance between safety and a vast multitude of things which can be achieved and harms which can be avoided by giving people everywhere greater privacy and assurance and confidence and enabling them to keep secrets even from the state, including several forms of safety. Which of these would you choose? It's... It's an emotive subject. Some people with a deep-seated belief in the precautionary principle approach balancing liberties uh, with arguments like, if just one child is saved, then any amount of inconvenience will be worth it. So it's important to know for what follows that earlier this year, the Home Office ran a £500,000 publicity campaign to lobby against 
encryption, against end-to-end -end encryption uh, implemented in Facebook Messenger. The big number on their website said that 14 million reports of suspected child sex abuse could be lost through encryption. That number, 14 million, was intentionally quoted out of context in order to get you upset and to make you feel angry. The facts begin to come clear when you read Meta's own analysis of abusive content and what they send upstream as reports, where in one representative sample, they found that more than 90% of it was duplicates, and that of the accounts sharing it, more than 75% did not appear to have any genuine malicious or abusive intent. It was ill-judged memes and people actually complaining about something dreadful they had found and sharing it in order to complain. If you don't believe Meta, you can read NCSC and GCHQ's own recent analysis, which provides similar numbers. GCHQ's report starts from an even bigger figure of 29 million reports and ends with 8,700 UK children being safeguarded in 2021. So that's a ratio, if ratios were meaningful at all, of 0.03%. But the GCHQ paper doesn't go so far as to mention the final outcomes, where for the same year, according to government figures, 1,930 children had protection plans for sexual abuse provided for them, which contrasts badly with 24,000 pla plans, over 12 times as many, for neglect, and nearly 19,000, that's 10 times as many, for emotional abuse. We clearly have a big societal problem with childcare, and although tech is a huge issue in children's lives, tech itself is not the big societal issue. Care is the big issue. But one other problem with heroically wanting to save just one child is that it is simply not how the world works. For example, the number of people killed or seriously injured on the roads, including children, has been flat for about the past decade. It's been always in the low 30,000s, uh, only marginally decreasing since 2010. That is until lockdown happened. The year 2020 saw 6,800 fewer people being killed or seriously injured, of whom 2,600 were children, compared to the year before. So, we see the opportunity for a concrete, manifest public good. We can save lives. We can reimpose national lockdown, save 26,000 children in the next decade, perhaps 68,000 people overall, save even more lives by reducing pollution and infection and so forth. So we should just bring back lockdown, right? That's common sense. But you don't hear many people proposing this. Why not? And it's Perhaps because there is an unremarked balance where it is less important to protect abstract hypothetical children than to enable an economy and to allow people to live their concrete actual lives. Speaking of what people should be allowed to do, the next thing we often hear is another exclamation, like um, people should not be allowed to keep secret from the states, as if their doing so were some kind of tech industry subversion of the uh, democratic process of democratic governance. However, in our society, we follow something called due process, including search warrants, which can cover people's devices. We do this because there's nothing in our society which strictly demands that people should be prevented from having privacy, assurance, and confidence, enabling them to keep secrets even from the state. And this is the case not least because criminalizing any such mechanism would outlaw skulls. We cannot read minds, and if we could, it would be highly dystopian. So, excusing that there may be consequences under some legislation, you in particular, you personally, are free to keep secrets about whatever you want within the contents, within the confines of your head. And if you hear someone say that privacy and integrity should be pierceable by the state, never forget to ask which state and for which people. Perhaps Russia, where citizens are stopped on the street and their messenger histories are searched. This is similar to the old sus laws, the um, stop and search powers as well, which were highly contentious in the uh, 1970s, 80s and 90s. Also, we can only wonder if we were to have um, means of state surveillance in encrypted messengers, which states would have been permitted oversight, for instance, of Sergei and Yulia Skripal's WhatsApp messages, and who would have arbitrated that? 
Like, would MI6 have sent a message to Facebook saying, do not let the FSB look at these people's messages even if they ask to do so. We can't tell you why, trust us. Somehow that seems unlikely. And of course, if there's a mechanism which is going to be used by British law enforcement, it'll be used by Indian and by American and by Russian and all the other countries to spy upon citizenry, who is going to arbitrate who can be um, spied upon by whom? The overall problem with pierceable privacy is that other than by grabbing someone's phone under warrant and subjecting it to forensic analysis, it's not selective. The process is not limited in purpose or scope, however much one might pretend that it is. So in terms of risk from the state, your message content cannot be only a little bit surveillable in the same way that you can't be only a little bit pregnant. The analysis capability and the surveillance capability are one and the same thing. And stuff like the historical progression of investigations under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act from anti-terrorism, which it was deemed necessary to pass the act in order to help solve, to fly tipping and hunting for parents who are cheating at school catchment areas, this progression indicates how strongly any surveillance function degrades and would become abused by governments over time. But again, let's not pretend there isn't an actual problem. As GCHQ's recent paper put, uh, put it, a societal problem, which we do need to address. There are new models and new techniques of harm like image-based sexual abuse including deep fakes of innocent victims there is child sexual uh, sexual exploitation imagery where even decades old illegal content can recirculate um, for years and years and not all of it gets reported to the police but is a technical fix permitting only selective privacy to selected individuals preventing people from having strong privacy and assurance and confidence by default preventing them from keeping secrets even from the state. Is that fair and proportionate and reasonable in an open society? If this is a societal problem, why pursue a technical fix? Why drill holes in everyone's data security and close off future industries which may stand upon that, when instead we could try to eliminate or mitigate behaviors which drive the abuse and drive a market for such material, and thereby protect more children overall for a smaller investment? We would be protecting those who we know are at risk and others whom we do not know about. If addressing a societal problem in a social manner is not possible nor effective, then why is the Home Office this week running a campaign to mitigate violence against women by educating men out of the habits which lead to it? Why do they do that rather than pursue a nice technical fix like putting microphones into everyone's houses? Who can say? Who can say? So one last cliche before we begin our panel session. It is sometimes glibly proposed that if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. But as a parent, I, for one, also deeply understand I do have something precious not to hide but to protect. I want to protect my family's and everyone else's future interests. I don't want my daughter growing up into an Orwellian dystopia, lacking freedoms and privacies and agency and control, which we, which I, which all of us have hitherto enjoyed. I firmly believe that this goal is best served by giving everyone everywhere greater privacy, assurance and confidence and enabling them to keep secrets even from the state. Yes, of course, there are risks and the risks need to be mitigated somehow, I believe in a more social manner. But they are not great risks and in any case life in general is risky. This is normal and any attempted solution will be worse.